In fact, I think that gives me actually a decent perspective from which to judge of what makes a global financial services jurisdiction thrive. And I say this because I'm a firm believer that Ireland actually thrives in terms of financial services activity and consequently also our regulators that have to watch our space. Now, simply put, uh, regulation um, with clear rules of engagement is certainly an important part of that. And uh, I would also like to say that I've engaged with many different regulators. At Bank of America, as you can imagine, the OCC and the Fed are big stakeholders. But here in Europe, I do remind my colleagues that it's about our joint supervisor team, so the CBI and the ECB, but also the single resolution board in Brussels. Difficult sometimes for other jurisdictions outside the European Union to understand the fragmentation of the oversight, but given the last 10 years of experience of the joint supervisory team activities, I think that's firmly embedded in our European supervisory culture and understanding for those of us who actually uh, owe regulators uh, an account. Now, um, we at Bank of America and more broadly the industry have indeed no interest in what I would like to call regulatory arbitrage. But we need stability and clarity. And I say this because this is something that attracted Bank of America when deciding to get ready for a time post-Brexit. Bank of America is obviously not alone. A number of other international banks have established the European Union headquarters here in Ireland. And that's certainly for a good reason and speaks for Ireland. Before I got into regulation, or in, before I get into regulation, let me share some thoughts about Ireland. No doubt, the revival of Ireland as a financial services hub post-financial crisis has been nothing less than remarkable. And uh, I say this because I hope that Bank of America would have made a contribution, a small contribution, by establishing itself here. But rather like our own business, I recognize that for a good regulator, uh, you have to be both local and global. And let me elaborate on that a little bit. Local uh, regulators are needed in terms of their ability to obviously have a dialogue with uh, folks like me and my team and get an insight of what's going on and what is challenging for a particular jurisdiction, in this case, of course, Ireland. And I say this because here in Ireland, we have a different set of banks. We have the large national champions that are active in consumer, retail, wholesale banking, and they do the full range of banking, whilst the international banks, like Bank of America, Citibank or Barclays, we are focused on the wholesale banking activities. And not just within the European Union, but also be beyond, because most of us, we actually operate for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So I like to remind uh, my regulators, the CBI here and the ECB, that I am not an Irish risk. I actually represent a true mix of European, Middle Eastern, and even some African risk. And that needs to be contemplated when you think about the quality of what a regulator needs to bring to the table to oversee multinational banks like Bank of America. Now, a global mindset is also important because what we really need is, a, if you will, a consistent global cooperative network, or rather a network, I should say, framework. And that is within the European Union, but also beyond. I like actually uh, to say that clearly there, not, there needs to be some national discretion. How do you supervise uh, big banks, national champions, and multinational banks? But consistency is really important from a global perspective. So having said this, we all know Ireland has, of course, a natural set of advantages by its close cooperation with the EU, the US, and the United Kingdom. And obviously, there are close historical but also practical links. I say this because I sense as a Spaniard born and educated in Germany, having worked in the UK and the US, uh, some of my European compatriots, they are jealous that Ireland enjoys this strong connectivity to key jurisdictions like the UK and the US. And of course, uh, now post practice, having a significant important seat within the European Union. But ultimately, any regulator can only be as good as its people. And I say this because the competition for talent does not affect only financial services companies, but it affects clearly regulators. That competition is not just domestic. Good regulatory professionals in Ireland are very well thought professionals that may be attracted by other regulators across Europe and even beyond. So um, here's the good news. Uh, and I say this because Ireland has many other attributes why to be here. 
And by the way, I'm only two years working in Ireland, and I was not planning to work in Ireland before Brexit, because there was no need to have a European headquartered bank within the European Union. Now, having had my own experience for two years now, uh, I'm delighted to share a couple of obvious and not so obvious points with you. Well, um, the other day I was asked by one of my colleagues, why did we not set up our European headquartered bank in Spain? Well, in England, uh, we speak English. In Ireland, we speak English. In Spain, we don't speak English. And frankly, in Ireland, we are actually pleased that we have uh, 35 different nationalities working for Bank of America. And I'm sure other multinational companies can easily beat that number. Uh, so the multinational attraction of talent and also the attraction, the attraction of uh, talent from Ireland with all the great academic, um, if you will, institutions is a big plus for Ireland. Secondly, um, Ireland has, of course, a strong macroeconomic foundation and also political stability. Since joining the European Union, uh, we obviously are mindful that Ireland is one of the fastest growing countries in terms of GDP growth. And uh, I'd like to think that will, be continue, that will continue to be the place. Also, not to ignore, 20 of the top 25 financial services companies in the world are here in Ireland. And uh, uh, to my recollection, at the end of 2021, 135 financial companies have moved to Dublin in order to be Brexit uh, or, or ready for a Brexit, post-Brexit environment, which we have now. What I also found to be interesting is of course that Ireland ranks number two after Germany in terms of assets that moved into the EU post-Brexit. That, that says a lot about Ireland. So this short list of advantages, of course, is very impressive, but also uh, the challenges of regulators to be up tiering their game are not small. And I'll speak about this a little bit uh, in a minute. Let me share, before I go there, actually, and talk about what we would like to hear from regulators, what we would like them to do, a few more uh, aspects in terms of the long-term perspective of Ireland. So Ireland's expected, expected population growth goes significantly above the average of the European Union. So between now and the next 10 years, of course, uh, more demand for qualified folks here in Ireland. Ireland's productivity is great, and Ireland ranks number three in terms of index of economic freedom. Very important. We had earlier in the earlier panel the focus on diversity and inclusion. I think Ireland embraces diversity and inclusion, and that's the reason why I alluded earlier to the 35 different nationalities that we have here. Also, uh, let me give you one other data point. Uh, Ireland is ranked number one in the European Union in terms of STEM graduates. So academia in science, technology, engineering, and math is a phenomenal supplier of talent that we at Bank of America massively benefit from. By the way, not only sourcing our requirements in Ireland, but sourcing our requirements around the world, since we have people that study in Ireland and join Bank of America, for example, in New York, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and in other locations. So that gives me a lot of confidence. But let me also now come to a couple of other points. As you have seen in the UK, a month can be a pretty long time, and there's a lot of change within a month. That can be true for business, but perhaps also for regulators. Uh, why do I say this? Well, a regulator may be perceived as very good as long as the last crisis allows it to be. Because if there's a hiccup in the next crisis, that regulator's track record is gone. And protecting that reputation is, of course, requiring high quality professionals. So there's no room for resting on laurels. In other words, Ireland has great opportunities. And of course, if it wishes to lead the way in terms of dynamic and forward-thinking approach, well, Ireland will have to do a lot more uh, than it has done so far. So let me cut through the chase now and tell you why we need uh, seven attributes from regulators in Ireland. And I heard from our panel leader that uh, the governor mentioned some of them this morning, so I ask uh, for uh, forgiveness that I may actually be in sync with some of the comments that the governor made this morning, which is great because that means that I hear what our uh, regulators are telling us. But let me start first with consistency. Let me give you an example, AML, my favorite topic, because we need to protect the reputation, not only of the bank, but also of our clients. Well, in Europe, as you know, we have implemented uh, different uh, EU directives. 
And now we are creating also uh, this AML authority or AMLA in order to bring us all together. Quite frankly, the cost of regulation in that space to actually comply with different jurisdictions across Europe when there should be one is something that doesn't help. So we need consistency. The second thing is risk-based approach. The level of regulation and supervisory intervention should be determined by the activities undertaken by the bank. Different banks take different risks, and therefore different regulatory approaches may apply. You can't regulate everybody and supervise everybody with the same uh, approach. Thirdly, predictability. There's a need for a regime where there's clarity about expectation from firms, both medium term and long term. The mountain of work to comply, obviously, with regulation is significant, and we want to make it as efficient as possible for both regulators and regulated entities. Forward-looking approach, uh, for me, that means actually avoiding retrospection. And what I mean by that is not penalizing firms for historical failures to meet newly introduced uh, standards that weren't even enforced at the time. Fifth, proportionality. Well, regulators need to set requirements and expectations in a manner proportionate to the nature, scale, and complexity of a country's banks. That benefits uh, the banks and the regulators. But let me also say it's not easy to implement this. There are different tiering systems, there are different thresholds, and obviously there's requirement for some local, if you will, adjusted uh, requirements. Transparency, well, uh, supervisory policies and decisions should be sufficiently clear and comparable, and I do appreciate that our regulators speak to us frequently to express their expectations and how we are doing. And as you know, there's an annual review process called Supervisory Review and Examination Process, SHREP, where you get a mark and where you get a detailed download of your regulators, in our case the Joint Supervisory Team, of how we are doing and what we should be addressing for the next year. All good. But uh, responsiveness is my last point here. It's essential, of course, that we need fast response time from regulators. When we deliver data, when we deliver information, we want, obviously, to get things done quickly to move on to the next topic. But there's one more item, number eight, not number seven. I said seven, but it's actually eight, where we, uh, I think, need the help. And that means a great jurisdiction has to be evolutionary, not revolutionary. Why do I say this? The world around us is changing. We had the invasion, we have inflation, we have high interest rates. And uh, 10 months ago, we would have not spoken about the invasion, we would have not spoken about inflation, and we would have probably spoken about a different level of interest rates, increased requirements. And, uh, and I say this because we have cyber, we have cryptocurrencies, we have the rise of non-bank financial institutions who are doing a great job, by the way, uh, but need to be supervised too. We have gold plating, and then we have cyclicality, just to name a few. So uh, having said this, Ireland has a great opportunity to embrace, if you will, sustainable finance. And that is critical for the future success of the financial services industry across different uh, uh, platforms. Uh, both, by the way, not only banks, but also non-banks, investors, everybody is ESG focused. And we know there's a lot of regulatory change coming our way. But uh, with that in mind, I want to say that Bank of America is very passionate about ESG. It didn't start recently with the Fit for 55 program of the European Union. It started back in 2007 when we committed $25 billion for sustainable finance. Then we upped it to 50, to 100, to 300. And between now and 2030, we have committed $1.5 trillion in sustainable finance. And that gives you an idea of how much, if you will, commercial pressure uh, we put on our bankers to actually accelerate the transition of our clients, facilitate the transition, and not make actually clients feel that they're going to be thrown out of the bank if they don't comply. But a very important topic where Ireland can lead the, the, the European Union's ambitions, and, uh, and, and, and rightly so. Having said this, um, what I would like to say is I have no reason to believe that Ireland is going to be very successful in the next decade based on the great existing foundations across various stakeholders. And they are, of course, the financial service companies, the legislators, and of course, our regulators. So thank you for listening to me. 
Thank you for actually very interesting contributions early in the day, and I look forward to our panel discussion, which probably will speak about this in a minute. Many thanks, Fernando, and interesting that we've come full circle to some of uh, the governor's opening remarks this morning. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome our final panel of the day uh, to be chaired by Mary Elizabeth McMunn, Central Bank Director of Credit Institutions. We also have Maria Ging, uh, Managing Director of BlackRock, Patricia Callan, Director of Financial Services Ireland Group at IBEC, Michael Murphy, Managing Director of New Ireland Wealth and Insurance at Bank of Ireland, and Michael McGrath, Assistant Secretary of the Financial Services Division at the Department of Finance. Over to you, Mary. Thanks, Jean, and good afternoon, everybody. And I, I think I have to say at this stage, thanks for staying on um, with us and, and being here. So uh, when, when we were speaking before uh, that we were the last panel on, on the first day, I uh, just appreciate you, you hanging around, and I'm looking forward to a good panel discussion. I'll keep this brief. Um, uh, as Jean said, my name is Mary Elizabeth McMahon. Our, our panel is entitled Ireland Regulation in a Global Financial Services Jurisdiction. And, and we bookended this panel at the end of the day because we thought it was important uh, to hear from experienced financial services professionals, influential policy makers and industry participants about their perspectives and lived experience about being part of the financial services uh, ec ecosystem. Um, I'm, I'm joined by a diverse panel. I first of all want to thank everybody uh, for being part of it. We're going to reflect on a couple of themes um, here today. Ireland's reputation as a global financial services hub, the regulatory approach uh, that's right uh, for an international financial system and, and the kind of key questions that we as regulators should be thinking about when it comes to priority setting for us over, over the, the next period. Um, I suppose there's no point in having a panel unless you have an audience and, there's, and it's really, really important that from my perspective that the audience gets the most out of this discussion as well. So please, <coughs> I'd encourage you to raise any questions, whether you're online or you're, or you're in the room, we're, we're very happy. I want to carve out some time for those. Um, so let me start by saying I know that everybody was here for the, the whole day, but I, I do remember Martin this morning talking about maybe we're a little bit too humble um, when we think about the financial services sector here and, and what we've achieved and, and what we've done. Um, but let me start by asking the panellists around their own reflections. Fernando has given us his in terms of Ireland's reputation as a, a global financial services hub. And Maria, I'll, I'll go this way along but maybe I'll ask you to start. Fabulous, thank you so much. And I'm going to take you at your word and I'm not going to be humble about <laughs> Ireland as a hub for international financial services and <coughs> asset management in particular. Um, and as Fernando was speaking, I was busy, busy you know, crossing off, throwing away the cue cards because <laughs> he's stolen many of my ideas. So this will be um, much of a, a repeat of, of what you mentioned, Fernando. But for me, you know, reputation is all about what other people think of us. And I think for asset management in particular, for me, there are four really strong external proof points that demonstrate the incredible reputation that asset management here in Ireland in particular has. And I think the first one has to be the men, women and families from across the globe, so not just Ireland, not just Europe, but globally, who have entrusted four trillion of their hard-earned savings to <coughs> Irish domiciled regulated product. That's absolutely incredible, and that's something that we should be really, really proud of. And it points to Ireland's reputation, firstly, for keeping those savings safe, but secondly, for delivering solutions for those savers that ultimately help them retire with dignity. So that's a really strong proof point of our reputation. I think the second one, and again, Fernando touched on it, is the number of fund and asset managers here um, that with really substantive operations here in Ireland. So there are over 70 fund and asset managers operating here, and they are here because of our reputation and because of their experience of the incredible ecosystem that we have here, many of whom are represented in the audience here, whether it's asset managers, administrators, depositories, the service firms, and equally the central bank have a hugely important role to play in that ecosystem. And speaking of the central bank, 
the perception and, and the reality, <coughs> that experienced reality here on the ground, is that after some reorganisation, the central bank is really coming into its own as a regulator for this industry. And the central bank provides a third proof point to me as to the strength of our reputation. And that is the number of senior figures in the central bank that are playing key roles in international institutions, whether it's ESMA, IOPA, ECB, ESRB, EBA, all of that cements our reputation. And it's really crucial that the central bank continues to nurture the next generation of talent to ensure that we keep Sabres safe, but also that the central bank has the strength and depth to support those international roles. And the fourth one is obvious to me when I look at a firm such as BlackRock. We are in a privileged position with asset managers across Europe, and we can launch product anywhere, but we consistently choose Ireland. Ireland is by far our largest fund domicile in EMEA. And the reason we choose Ireland is because of our lived experience of the incredible ecosystem that we have here that enables and facilitates us in delivering for clients. And that's ultimately what everybody here is trying to do to deliver for our clients. So for me, being proud of our, our asset management framework in particular, I think those four really strong external proof points are very compelling. Um, if it was to caveat my response just a little bit, there's, there's always a hitch. Um, I think that reputation has been built on a really strong track record of delivery on USITs, money market funds, and ETFs in particular, whereas we don't have a stronger reputation in private assets. And again, just looking at those proof points, we don't have an Irish ELTIF. Loan funds are significantly restricted, and other domiciles have a wider variety of solutions for private assets. So I think if we want to continue to strengthen our reputation, we do need to address private assets to ensure that um, we continue to strengthen our reputation, but also that we continue to provide um, solutions for savers that they really need in these inflationary times. Thanks very much. Patricia, I'll turn to you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, and I guess I'm a relative newcomer because I only took up this role in May. Um, financial Services Ireland is the IBEC Trade Association that's uh, across all the financial sectors. So it's been very interesting meeting like retail banks, international banks, insurers, reinsurers, funds, aircraft leasing. And the feedback by and large across everybody is very much that Ireland is still a great place to do business, uh, to set up. Uh, but it's not without its challenges. And I guess the, the big thing that people are very conscious of is the need to always be competitive, that we're only as good as what everyone else in the world is doing, and that even though we might be you know, really progressing in a certain area, that, that our competitors are always out there and that we need to be really, really aware and conscious of that. Um, I think the experience when you ask individual firms about their experience being a regulated entity, by and large, it's very positive because you know there's very professional people in the central bank. Uh, it's uh, people have good relationships, but they also place huge emphasis on it. Like, I mean, this is not, you know, it's core to their business strategy, and I think that's that's really important. But I do think, and it worries me, is that there is a perception. It's it's a conversation point, and I hear it in the context of what people in the UK say or in Luxembourg say that there's this sense that Ireland isn't as open for business as it may once have been. And the difficulty with perception versus reality is that then people can stop looking here to invest. Now, I don't think we've, we've seen, you know, in, in terms of a peat loan earlier and empirical evidence, the evidence is in the fact that companies are still establishing here. We've uh, smashed our target in terms of Ireland for finance already with the 52,000 jobs, and the government has now set a new target of another 5,000 in the next uh, uh, three years. So, I, I, But I do think, you know, again, it's, it's, it's to be conscious of that and that we, we really do need, I think in particular, to, to upskill and to get ahead of the next thing because Ireland's reputation was built on the fact that we had really good skills in, for example, cross-border life assurance in terms of funds, and the central bank upskilled to match the businesses that were coming here. It's a very tight labour market for everybody, and therefore we need more willingness. And I think industry is certainly very willing to share expertise into the central bank. So, you know, in terms of having uh, some sort of a, of, of a career redeployment piece of people moving in and out, not necessarily of supervision, but other areas, and people really understanding what are the next trends, because what we 
were good at in the past is not what we're going to be good at in the future. So there is a huge piece, I think, in terms of the central bank being more open, more engaged, and industry realizing that, well, actually, we can never be regulated properly if the people who are regulating us don't understand us. Uh, and that goes into new and innovative uh, firms in particular. Uh, and indeed, I think, again, as we discussed at the last uh, financial services stakeholder forum, where on authorizations, you know, again, people have, you know, definitely seen improvements. But in every aspect of business, we need greater efficiency, we need service level agreements, we need response times, uh, and in particular uh, around the issue of PCFs, which has been raised repeatedly, that you know, it's just really hard now getting people to move jobs, and that, that's, that's curtailing our, our, our ability. So I do think um, there's a more fundamental issue for, for everybody in government in this room uh, about what's our risk appetite. You know, do we want certain types of products? Do we want to be cutting edge? And if we don't, we should be clear and tell people Ireland's not open for business, go here. But I do think in terms of these newer innovations, it's very clear that the regulator that does it first gets all the business, the country gets all the business that follows. Uh, and that unfortunately, uh, again, in, in the Industry Advisory Council that I'm the Secretariat for, for the government, the five international members very much view that other jurisdictions are stealing a march on us here. And, and we need to be very watchful and very adaptable in terms of what we're doing here. It's not that we can't, but we just need to, to, to keep on that path. And we've done it in the past, we can do it in the future. Thanks very much for that. <clears throat> so I'm hearing proud but not being complacent. And uh, mm. as the governor of the Bank of France said earlier, continued vigilance for all of us, mm. you know, in terms of steering the path mm. forward. Michael, welcome to you. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you. I mean, just having seen this uh, change and evolve over the last 25 years, I think we're in a really positive position. And I think it is important that we are, we shout about it and we are very proud about it. I think we're really well positioned in Europe and internationally. We're well connected to other markets. I think we have very strong connections, both from a business perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective. I think we're really well respected in terms of the quality and transparency of Ireland as a financial services centre. And The word trusted was used a lot earlier, um, and I think that's really key and very central to that. Uh, we have good access to talent. Um, and experience, but again, we can't be complacent around that, and that's one that we need to have. We, we, we need to watch and be very uh, open and mindful to. Um, I think we're well established as a, what I would describe now, and maybe not 25 years ago, but as a mature international financial services hub. And what I like is that there's a strong customer and conduct focus as well as a strong prudential focus. And I think both are equally important when you talk about yourself as a, as a regulated market. And I think that strength of regulation does mean that we attract the right type and the right quality of company. Companies with the right governance in place, the right controls and the right operating models. With, uh, and, and we have a really good track record, whether it's on the PNC side, the life and pension side, the reinsurance side, funds and banking whether it's large companies or very, very small companies starting up, I think we have a really good track record of regulating those companies and allowing them to become successful. And, and I know there is some short-term pain um, for some companies as they're coming into the market, but overall it's really positive for Ireland in the long term that we have a robust and sustainable framework for the market. I think the other one I just want to mention, and, and it doesn't get talked about as much, is that our position as a financial services hub is nicely complemented by our really strong reputation as a global technology and data provider, and having the right regulation around that. Um, and certainly given the direction of travel for financial services and the importance of both data and technology, I think that's really positive for us. And I think we should work to kind of bring those closer together. So overall, look, I think we're really well positioned um, today and for the future. I think Fernando mentioned it, Patricia mentioned it again. It's just, you're only as good as your last game. And maintaining this is absolutely key not to become complacent and to make sure that we continue our success that we've had post-Brexit, but it is about that upskilling to be ready to regulate effectively. Uh, thanks very much for that, Michael. And I might come back to a question that I've got here. I'll let you think about it in terms of, is, uh, before, uh, after, I, after uh, Michael McGrath uh, comes in, is Ireland's reputation such that it is seen as a place for innovation in financial services? So uh, given that you touched on our, uh, us also being viewed in terms of the kind of ecosystem that's here, you, yeah. you might come back to that point. Yeah. But Michael McGrath, why don't I let you come in first? Thanks. 
Thanks very much. And first of all, just said, delighted to be here and uh, very much appreciative of the opportunity. I think it's been a really good debate and a, a great um, kind of innovation of itself to, to do this. I'm also struck by the title, uh, and I think we need to just remember that it's supporting the economy, delivering for the consumer. So straight away, uh, it's not about financial services for the sake of financial services. And I think sometimes the discussions get lost in that rather than looking at what we're actually about, whether it's the Irish economy or whether it's the European economy that we're very much interlinked into. So I think that's just a, a, an opening observation. So in terms of sort of kind of <coughs> reputation, I mean, a lot has been said already, but ju just sort of say, we are a very large financial services hub, both you know, European and internationally. So the minister mentioned, I think, somewhere around about in excess of 52,000 employed. That's employed in the range of services in the international financial services. We've possibly about the same again in the domestic looking financial mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, and, and I know our topics this morning have been kind of floating back. The cultural ones a lot more maybe about the banks and insurance domestically or whatever. So I think it's, it's we need to look at it. It's a very sizable sector here. Uh, it's regionally dispersed right around the country. We have some very significant global players, Fernando's Bank for, for one. And, you know, that didn't come about by chance. I think that's a reflection in government policy of almost now four decades. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important, that consistency of policy. And I think the latest articulation of that policy was the recently published strategy that we had uh, of, of an update on the IFS strategy about, about a month ago. And I think the themes there, which we've, we've touched and heard earlier today, the idea of digital, sustainable finance, the regional aspect, and also then that talent piece. And I think that, that's important. Mm -hmm. But just to think of a couple of other comments, just to very briefly, I would say, first of all, I kind of look at it, we're strong advocates of the European single market. So, you know, we want to see open markets, we want to see consistent application of the rules, regardless where, what, where your entry point is into the market. We, we want to sort of see that. Doesn't always happen, but that's what we want to see. So the jargon piece, we want the level playing field. We want to see the supervisory convergence. We don't always see that, but that's where we want to strive it. And sometimes maybe we don't like the results that we see out of it, but I think we have to live by our own words and that. I think our reputation as a large centre with a strong, maybe harsh firm, but a strong, credible regulator is something that is important and is kind of a very much a badge for us that we need to protect. Because I think we are listened at the European table. I mean, in the context of, say, my kind of role, say, in terms of the policy space, I sit on a monthly basis at the Financial Services Committee in, in Brussels. It's, it's made up of the 27 member states and then of the Commission, uh, ECB and the various ECs and other institutions. There are only a few member states that really are there speaking with experience and expertise and that, that comes from our dialogue with industry because I'm, you know, my, I'm not, my day job isn't, I'm not running a financial uh, centre, so it's more the policy side. But we are listened to and I think that's very important. Uh, we are pragmatic. I think I heard the governor talk about that earlier today. So that experience is really important, and, and we can't lose sight of that, you know, when, when we do it. So in terms of just summing up at this point, for me, I would definitely say our reputation is good, but we cannot be complacent. Yeah, yeah. We need to keep moving forward. We need to keep challenging ourselves, challenging, and when I say ourselves, I mean the policymakers, at the level one, the regulators, supervisors, the industry, us collectively. I think that's really very important because if we're going to be innovative, if we're going to be agile, if we're going to look at that, we need to keep doing that. So I think we've got a good base, but if we sit around and clap ourselves in the back, we won't have it for long. So I think that's where we just need to make sure we don't let complacency sit in. Thanks very much, and I think that's, um, that's actually come through by almost everything, all of you said, that, that thread in terms of um, appreciating what we have, but continuing to be responsive and lo look to the future. Um, Michael, 
do you want to respond to that question that I've encouraged people to come uh, to, to ask in terms of uh, Ireland's reputation? Is Ireland's reputation such that it is seen as a place for innovation and financial services? Any reflections on that or if any other panel members want to touch yeah, on? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. And part of that is the ecosystem in financial services, but data technology. And also, I think that kind of wider provider network in terms of support, whether it's advisory, whether it's other yeah. businesses built around that. So I think we are really well positioned in terms of being that ecosystem. We also have a very strong track record of innovation. And you know, we were talking the funds just mentioned, like we have a really strong track record there in the life and pension space with some of the Italian companies setting up here to sell back into Italy. Again, really, really strong. But we need to continue to evolve. We need to continue to innovate. And we need to make sure our regulation keeps up such that when we are innovating, there's a different skill set needed to, to regulate the kind of products coming in that people are doing. So I think we all need to work together as an industry to make sure that we all have the right supports in place to be able to do that. But I do think we have a very strong track record right across all of the different components of the FS industry. Uh, thanks very much for that. I think the skills, the skills both within the regulatory authorities, the skills within yeah. the financial services firms, the skills more wider than that, it's a theme that's coming up throughout the day in terms of that in an environment where, where the, the talent, it, it is a competitive environment. Um, maybe uh, Maria, Michael McGrath, just a, cu a couple of, uh, a, quest a question for yourselves in terms of um, words that come to mind uh, when, we, when we think about the approach of a, a regulator in an international financial services centre, uh, credibility, uh, consistency, you've mentioned the governor had a speech, you also mentioned it, uh, Fernando, how we think about competition. I thought cooperation was another word that came, came through from this morning's <coughs> discussion. Maria, maybe I'd ask you and then uh, Michael McGraw, I'll ask you to come in in terms of what are the kind of words that come to mind for you? Yeah, I think there's a couple that, that come to mind for me and maybe the most fundamental one, which is the base of everything we do, and Fernando touched on it earlier, is a predictable process. Everybody in industry wants everything faster, let's be honest, but what we value even more is a predictable process consistently applied. And that's fundamental to Michael's point to enable us to deliver for savers and for consumers, but also to your earlier question to help protect the reputation of this domicile. So I think first and foremost, a predictable process. I think maybe a second word, a bunch of words, um, I'm, I'm break, breaking the rules here, but it's regulators being responsive and accessible. Um, keeping on top of markets is a full-time job for everybody in the industry at the moment, and we can only expect the same from our regulators. There are a large number of market innovations out there, and they can provide tremendous solutions for customers and for savers, but they can have downsides. And a responsive regulator needs to be engaged with industry and talking to them on a regular basis to ensure that they can assess the emerging risk, but also understand the opportunities that firms are likely to want their consumers um, to participate in. So, you know, we absolutely want healthy skepticism. It encourages us all to up our game. But to deliver effective regulation, regulators need frequent outreach and dialogue with industry. Not, not regulatory capture at all at all, but just healthy and robust dialogue and understanding. A third word that I'd like to throw in there is reg tech. I think this industry produces a huge amount of data um, and regulators need to have the tools to assess it um, and to share it with their EU counterparts and international counterparts. And the benefit of RegTech is that requests for data are not duplicative, they can be standardised, they can be automated. And it also, to protect consumers and to protect savers, regulators need to invest in that technology to sift through the data and identify any emerging risks or emerging trends that they want to engage with industry on. So I think reg tech is ultimately necessary to protect savers and to protect the, reg the reputation of the domicile. And then it's the consistent theme of, I think, all the panels today, but it's ensuring skill sets are up to date, but also ensuring that regulators are recruiting the talent necessary to build the regulator of the future. And that has come out consistently. We, we all know the 
incredibly steep learning curve that we've all been on on sustainability. But what's next? Is it private assets that I mentioned earlier? Is it some of the emerging technologies, DLTs, tokenization? Whatever that is, we need the regulators to be ready. So that's quite a lot of words, <laughs> but that's my yeah. view on, on some of the areas regulators should no, focus no, no. on. Thanks, thanks indeed, a comprehensive response. Um, Michael, I'll turn to you. Yeah, um, maybe I'll start by going back to the words that you mentioned to begin with credibility, consistency, competition, and then maybe I'll just throw out a, a couple of more just very briefly in the time. So I think first of all, like, we have a very vibrant, diverse sector here supporting European investment. And we have EU regulation, which is kind of harmonized rules and we can passport. And we do have global brands, so the likes of Usits and so forth. And I do know Maria's lamented LTIF, but maybe the refresh we're doing in that as a quick segue might help there. So we do have a lot of credibility. And when I say we, I mean the system, and I'm thinking more here in, in the European, which we're deeply embedded in. But I, then if I think of your sort of, your, you're talking about your consistency, um, coherency piece, I, I think we also have like, our activity is global and we need to have global cooperation at the standard setters. So some of those we are part of, some of those we're on the margins of or whatever, but we need to make sure that we're there. So FSB, the Basel Committee, FATF in terms of, I heard Fernando talk about AML, uh, IOSCO, we had Martin here th this morning. I think that's very important that we get that. So we get some coherency, some consistency, and then no surprises. I think industry generally like would like the answer they want, but then they'd certainly want to get a consistent certainty if they're not getting the answer they want, but that bit rather than the surprises. And I think when we distill it all down and we come from Brussels with the rules and then work through all the things. We have to have the sort of the detailed national laws or regulations that come in. We have to remain focused on that, what I see competitive piece in terms of looking at where other jurisdictions are. And it's not by any way to be competitive for a race to low standards, because I think, and I mentioned it in my first round, that badge of that high reputation, I think that's really important and, and, and to, be, um, to, to be sort of prized. So I think, I think that's fair. But we do need to be aware of that regulatory framework in terms of how we do it to make sure that we remain competitive to support the economy, to deliver for, for um, consumers. A couple of words I won't explain, but just there, we've heard it already today, simple. We talk in jargon all day long, transparent, engagement, diversity. And then the last one, which I just spent one minute just very quickly, and Fernando touched on earlier, is risk-based approach. There is no doubt in my mind that like, so we cannot eliminate risk, but we need to understand it. We need to know what our appetite is. We need to be clear in our mitigants. We need to be clear in our framework crystal clear in our toolkit instruments and whatever when things do go wrong. We need to build the resilience, the frameworks is vital. But we need to do it in a way that we make sure that we haven't built it so tight around that there's nothing you know, there. So that's what I mean, it's not zero risk. We need to get that proportionality piece, piece right. And when I say we, and I keep saying we there, that's a role for the, the policy makers, the legislators, the regulators, the supervisors, and for industry. So I think collectively we need to kind of work on that. So I think you asked for a few words. I'll give you a bit more, but there you go. <laughs> no, there's, there's so much there, and I think time is against us, but thanks very much, Michael. And there's so many threads that you've kind of opened that I'd like to pull, but then uh, the job of a moderator is actually to keep things on time. So I, I have to take that as one of my first principles. I mean, for me, though, just a couple of reflections on or one reflection. I think there are certain things that are kind of principles that we will continue to, to have as part Part of the toolkit is part of how we are, but we have to kind of think about the evolving context in which they operate and ensuring that do they need to be tweaks to those uh, fundamental elements that, that keep us fit for the future. And I think that's a lot of what our strategy is trying to achieve in terms of future focused. Fernando, I'll turn to you and maybe to Patricia and uh, Michael Murphy after that, because you spoke <coughs> as your eighth item, you spoke about evolutionary. You had said you were giving us seven.
seven, but you said the most important is terms of evolution in terms of of of, uh, of of how we operate. And when you think about how regulators set priorities for for the next uh, coming years, and we're in year year one of our our strategy uh, for next strategic cycle. What are the kind of key questions that you think that we should be thinking of to inform those priority areas for us? Well, I have a very practical example, and that relates to private credit. In the US, 50% of credit is provided by private credit providers, not financial institutions. In America, if you want to know where the money sits uh, in a down cycle, you want to have the ability to actually have access, control, and visibility of data. Here in Europe, right now, it's only 20% of private credit providers providing credit. But that number is growing fast, which is good. It's a diversity of funding sources for our corporate clients, for anybody who needs money. But if you have a good handle on banks, how do you get a good handle between now and the next five years on private credit providers who, in case of a down cycle, you can't just push a button and get information from them while you expect to get the information from us any day of the week. So that's one aspect. <coughs> the second aspect I would say is digitalization. The trend is our friend, it's great. <coughs> uh, here in Ireland, obviously, we have a lot of uh, cloud capacity, uh, but uh, how do you actually supervise uh, the outsourced function? Mm. How much, how little do banks outsource? We right now have a data exam in our bank, your colleagues, and the ECB are in our premises. And the first question I ask them is, how do you protect my data that I'm giving to you as part of a very comprehensive data exam? And the answer was, it's in-house. You don't use vendors. Great for me, gives me great assurance. But given the, the, the digitalization explosive trend, how do we protect uh, not only consumers, but also the world of uh, large corporates that do not want to get stuck because the system is not working. So an area for you to explore, and I'll keep it short. Thank you very much uh, for that. I think we could spend a whole afternoon on operational resilience and critical third party providers and data protection. Uh, thanks, Fernando. Uh, Patricia, I'll, t I'll turn to you to, on, on the same topic. I think it's very important, going back to the innovation piece earlier, what I've certainly noticed is that there's a lot of innovation and a lot of the companies in this space call themselves technology firms, not even necessarily fintechs, and I think we're seeing increasingly tales of people who go the whole way to the end in terms of trying to get authorised, get into the system of the finance system, and then essentially decide to sell out. It's easier just to sell that tech into the mainstream providers and, and move on. So I do think that tells us something. And really, this whole concept of the regulatory sandbox being able to test in market whilst protecting consumers and particularly that cross-border element for, for a country like Ireland is, is, is essential. So we do have to get our, our heads around that. We want more, either they're homegrown or they're international people with a big base here. We want to see them come through successfully uh, and actually manage to, to, again, offer a variety of services for everybody. Um, I do think as well that in terms of, you know, it's been discussed earlier, in terms of rev I guess evolution of regulation, SEER is obviously very important and uh, it's been talked about in other panels in terms of the individual accountability regime and people are genuinely very worried and there's a lot of very talented people that are saying well why would I work for a, f a financial company versus a technology company or wherever else. So we do need to be very clear as to you know, what, it, what that's going to mean. I've heard the governor give speeches where he says well hopefully we won't ever use it, it's just there as a deterrent. but. The risks are, if the risks become too great, we're not going to get great people coming here anymore. So we do certainly, I think, need to bear that in mind on, on, on that all day long. We talk about the balance of all of these things. Um, and the last thing I think um, for me, it's going back, I guess, to the first point about reputation, but this tone issue, uh, and I've been very struck by that as an outsider having, having come into this sector, is that we've all spoken about how great this sector is, but even people who are in the lobbying space who understand how Ireland works, I, I was uh, in a very bad, a big, big <laughs> corporation, and I said there's 105,000 people employed in financial services, and no one has any idea. So I do think <coughs> policy, CBI, ourselves, we need to tell our story domestically more, because that also helps us with the talent, because a lot of businesses here, no one's ever heard of them, they don't know their brand names, they're, they're selling overseas, they're not in the domestic market. But I think also, 
I'm very struck that the political system is still stuck in you know, the, re the last recession and talks very negatively around financial services. And I think the central bank sometimes in its tone in terms of dear CEO letters that have gone global, that that tone is really important and that sends a message. So there's a job of work across the board to build trust and credibility, to very much work together in terms of just reshaping the whole reputation about everything to do with financial services. And that's educating people about the types of business that are here, as well as the products, going back to the financial literacy, I think it's a, it's a, it's a well-kept secret. But if we really enhance our reputation, then that will help us, again, with the, the regulatory piece, I think, going forward as well. Thanks very much, Patricia. Michael, I ask you yeah, Look, uh, similar themes to touched on earlier. For me, there's a, probably three areas. The first is around simplification and reducing complexity. The like financial services industry is too complex, and that creates risk for us in terms of managing our businesses. But it also makes it hard for our customers to understand and navigate um, the industry. There's a lot of legacy product systems, tax processes, even the way we think as an industry. Sometimes it's, well, this is the way it works in insurance, and you kind of go, well, hang on, is that the right thing or not? Um, we need to think about how we can make it easier for our customers, and we need to think about how regulation can support that and make that happen. I think the, the second area for me is around the cost and the effectiveness of governance and oversight within financial services entities, and there's kind of two areas. The first is just the sheer scale and cost of the ongoing regulatory and reporting changes that are happening and the changes in regime. And I think we need to balance that evolution and change and the need to protect our customers at all times with just the sheer overall scale of change across different regulatory regimes coming through and maybe just a cost benefit of each one at times. And IFRS 17 is my bugbear at the moment where I look at you know, what difference it's making for customers or not and the kind of cost and complexity it's introducing to our industry. And just making sure that when you add up all of the change, making sure that it's not overwhelming businesses that are seeking all the time to comply, to manage risk, to serve our customers and to transform. So we just need to manage that overall level of change from a cost and complexity perspective. And the second is that ongoing cost of oversight in our industry, whether it's board, board committees, three lines of defense, first line risk group oversight, the external oversight from auditors, peer reviewers, expert reviewers, uh, you know, multiple regulators. I think it does work well overall today, but as we evolve, um, just to be aware that more doesn't always mean better. So I'm thinking of 300-page committee reports and everyone trying to put every single risk into a report. I'm thinking about 80-page kid documents through PRIPS where you know customers look at it and maybe don't understand everything that's in there. And I'm thinking about four different committees talking about broadly the same thing. So I'd love us to have a really laser-like focus on the key risks within our industry and what really matters to our customers, to be concise and really clear about our communication to customers, not telling them everything in 80 pages of documents, and just to avoid duplication in terms of what we're doing. And I do think the future of regulation does have a role in enabling that greater effectiveness. Um, and the third area is the one that probably worries me most, is just keeping up with the scale and the pace of change. And we know we have to catch up as an industry and get ahead of other industries to meet those evolving customer expectations. So we need to think about how we do that and how we remove the fear of failure while at the same time protecting customers at all times, and that is paramount. Um, but allowing mistakes, but at the same time not allowing mistakes. So that's a, that's a tricky kind of conundrum to evolving our governance and controls away from the way we've always done it to the way we would like to do it um, and looking forward. And, and I would say making it safe for executives to be different and to drive the kind of transformation while at the same time ensuring it's done safely, sustainably. And, and ultimately, that rear view lens is very, very powerful. Um, and we've all seen it, those of us who've had long careers. And to ensure that people looking back at what we've done as an industry in 10 or 20 years, we aren't going, what the hell were they thinking when they did that? And that one probably keeps me awake most at night. And like, we are all trying to do the right thing. And even with a good culture, there are diverse perspectives in terms of what right and wrong looks like and what good and bad looks like. 
And I do think that what good looks like today and what's important today will be very, very different in 10 or 20 years. So we need to try and get it right for today as we're looking to build tomorrow and get it right for tomorrow. And some of the obvious areas that are evolving rapidly are around cyber, cyber security, data management controls, and data privacy, even operational resilience in what is a dispersed operating model today, and that's very quickly moved into a very dispersed operating model. ESG and IND, they're very important to us in Bank of Ireland and New Ireland at the moment, and, and evolving and growing, and, and they're areas that everyone's going to do it slightly differently, so what good looks like will be different for every organisation. But it does all come back to talent and making sure, as a financial services industry and in Ireland, that we can attract, retain and develop the right talent to drive that kind of transformation that we need. To, to allow us to regulate effectively in a rapidly changing environment. And pay is going to be important around that. You know, culture is going to be really important, and ways of working are going to be really important in evolving as we do that. So they are all components and are critical to make sure we have the right people and the right leadership to really drive forward this kind of change. And I think regulation is a critical enabler and a really big opportunity to get that simplicity, to improve our effectiveness, to transform our industry and to shape the right culture going forward. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Michael. I think there probably isn't a person in the room who has been part of a uh, committee structures over the years where we would all look for less information yeah. to allow to kind of really yeah, focus absolutely. in on the key, key yeah. decisions. So I think a lot of us will identify with that. There's so much in that, including kind of point issues that I do see actually in our strategy going forward or things that we are considering um, at the European table. But I'm hearing simplify, uh, not being afraid to dismantle structures that are not achieving the right outcome and being brave on that. And talent is both at a leadership level, but also in terms of skills, skills and, and capability, um, because I think we're all operating in that environment of where the pace of change is faster than it has ever been uh, before. Absolutely. So it really does require that laser focus. Um, I'm conscious I took one from the, the um, a question, uh, so thank you all very much. Um, let's see if there's any questions from the floor. So uh, my eye immediately has gone here, so um, we'll just take a few questions. So I see Jerry is waiting to yeah. close. So. Uh, Jerry Hassett, Intertech.ie. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in fintech, and for me, fintech, we've been really successful in uh, attracting so many established firms to Ireland. The next wave of growth is fintech, and I'm not sure we're as well positioned in that. I think fintech, we can have companies coming here, scaling internationally, creating jobs, but also bringing new competition and new players to a market, bringing you know, new experiences for our consumers. And particularly, it's not an area we, we get outperformed a lot. I look at the UK post-Brexit, They've really upped their game around fintech, and I see a lot of agility right across their policy stream. And just interested in your thoughts about, are, is Ireland performing at the fintech game internationally at the level it needs to? And, and if not, what we could do to maybe improve our performance there? Thanks, sir. Who would like to take it? I can. Michael. Yeah. Oh. No, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll Thank you. give an attempt at a bit of this. Um, so I think, first of all, we probably have a lot more to do. So that's the, the, the short answer there. Uh, I think there's a huge challenge for us all. I mean, if I think of like the, the EU talks about that the, the future of finance is digital. And I think that then brings us straight into a challenge spot in terms of that digital in its purest is running at nanosecond type innovation. And regulation at its purest is running a glacial type. I mean, you know, you sit there, it takes a long time. So, and when the two of those meet, they're, they're, we're talking different languages quite often. So I think that's a difficult, that's a challenge for us policymakers. It's a challenge for regulators. It's a challenge for the industry as well, because, you know, you, you look at some of the innovations that have gone on in the digital currency space in terms of, of, of that, just to mention one big global issue there. It was very clear, is this a stable coin, is this that? What it, it became very something very different after each set of questions. But that's because the fintech side is just innovating. But the regulator or the policymakers are trying to sort of say, well, what is it that we're trying to, to do? So, so that's a big challenge. In terms of Ireland, I mean, I think we have within the department 
uh, over the last 12 months had a, a fintech group looking at this internally? I mean, I know the, the bank has the innovation hub in terms of this. Uh, we're very clear in part of our strategy and kind of rolling it out that we want to engage more with uh, industry. Uh, Minister of State Fleming is keen to, to meet with industry uh, later this month. Uh, yeah, we're in November. Yeah, later this month um, on, on this whole, whole issue that's here. But, I mean, there are no quick fixes in this. And yes, other countries can be somewhat more nimble in some areas, but then when you start to dig a little bit more, some of it is rhetoric. And we all do a bit of that as well. So I think we need to be just, just honest about that. But there are just some immediate observations back to Jerry's question. Patricia, very quickly, and I'll take one more. Yeah, to and I think just Thank as you. a general piece of feedback, certainly, and in, into that UK model, I think the joined up nature is certainly working for them. And that brings us to the thorny topic of, you know, should the central bank here have a competition mandate? And it's not as clear cut as even those words, but the idea that we're just all in this ecosystem very clear about what we want to do to be co joined, and that really, that for the market to work, optimally, then we do need to encourage more new entrants and we need to ensure that they can stay when they're here. So it's not about, again, yeah. dumbing down or de-risking or, you know, uh, uh, getting rid of regulation or, or separation of, of duties. It's about us working more together. And that's what the UK is. Certainly, we had a uh, London City of Dialogue uh, earlier. The last one was in Stillfall, but yeah. one earlier was in digital. And certainly people were really struck just by how everyone is on message there. And they the fiscal system works, the government works, and the regulator works together with industry, and that's what's the secret of success. Thanks, Patricia. I'll be really quick. As, yeah, a, as sure. a kind of user of fintechs and, and, and an organization that has used them to accelerate our strategy, um, you know, I think we need to trust our governance and control frameworks as well, that, you know, particularly from a provider management perspective, um, to, to step in and enable us to control what are all very different companies. We use that word fintech, but they're all very, very different at different stages of evolution. And as they evolve and their cultures evolve, they become very different organizations. So it's about us having the right control frameworks in place to work with them as they evolve, but not to change what's great about them because there's a reason we're bringing them in and not turn them into us because that's a failure too, mm. um, but to actually get what's great about them, but to make sure we have the right controls in place to catch anything as it occurs within our organization and doesn't allow any detriment. Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to take one more question from the floor. Um, yep. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mary Elizabeth. Uh, Patrick Burke from Irish Life. Uh, a quick commentary to move into a, a question, if that's all right. When we talk about supporting the economy and delivering to the consumer, we're all very familiar with the challenges of sustainability and climate and as they're facing us. Uh, and I think the bank has, in our experience, certainly performed extremely well in assisting the transition of public market funds, if I can put it that way, uh, to, to produce better results, better outcomes for both consumers and for the climate. I was taken by the points uh, that Maria and Patricia made just in relation to private assets and structures that enable private investments. Uh, I think if I'm right, Michael, the number is about 130 billion that has to be invested over the next five or so years in this state. And I just wonder how is that factored into the strategy in the bank in terms of the capability to provide those fund structures and whether Patricia and Maria would share that, that perspective. Can't comment for the bank, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but certainly from an industry perspective, obviously industry are aware and, and stand ready and, and willing to get that capital invested and we engage regularly with the central bank and regularly with the department to ensure that we do have the structures here to support that. I mentioned the LTIF earlier, loan funds, it's, it's both debt and equity financing that, that goes there and um, that goes into these type of entities and the green transition um, you know, is, is happening now and we talk about delivering for our consumers, but consumers want to invest in sustainable assets now um, and we have to have products available. So at the moment we're in this quite sort of awkward situation where the, the regulatory landscape is catching up with that consumer demand um, and asset managers such as ourselves you know, we want to provide solutions for savers, so we are launching sustainable products now using 
um, the, the structures that are available to us, whether that's USITs and ETFs here in Ireland, or whether it's kind of private market vehicles that are, that are domiciled elsewhere. But for us, it's really about meeting that investor demand right now, and then working with the regulators, working with the department to ensure that we have the right dis structures and the right understanding of, of what sustainability means and what sustainability, I suppose, what sustainability means for the industry, but also what sustainability means for investors. Um, so I think the, certainly the demand is there. The asset managers are, are stepping up to, um, to meet that demand and also um, fulfill that, that need to basically transition the entire world to a more sustainable basis um, and also manage the risks inherent in all of that because ultimately sustainability risk is investment risk for um, as we see it. Um, so we are stepping up, we need more structures, but we are definitely partnering with all of the institutions to ensure that we meet that demand. Well, I think just in, 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 as a build on going back to the skills issue again, because it's so new for everybody, I think we're putting a very particular focus in the FSI sustainability work around trying to upskill all of the employees and all the financial services companies because everyone is just grappling with their own strategies and indeed we're not very clear because again, it's a global issue that we, ideally you'd have global regulation, but you know, we're a bit away from that. So I do think, you know, putting that focus and, and as a result, we've, we've launched the first uh, a compliance course uh, in sustainable finance, starting with compliance professionals and building that out then into the firms in terms of other job functions, because we need to actually make sure that in terms of developing those products, uh, and that, that there is an ecosystem within the, the businesses as well. So it's certainly going to be a key f area of focus for, for the next year. And I think in terms of ESG sustainability, Michael mentioned it, I think our role in, in the European, uh, I suppose, architecture in terms of driving, whether it's policy, frameworks, practices, expectations, I think that's something where we see ourselves in a very active space. And I know from conversations with you and from other uh, US colleagues is that they very much see Europe as leading um, in, in this regard. And I think that's, that's a good place to be. I'm going to give you 30 seconds and then I will close. Try Michael. and keep it to less. Yeah. I just think it's a unique option opportunity for us within the sector. You know, we have so many assets at our disposal that to drive real social change around ESG, I think we've never been better positioned in that regard. And I think collectively as an industry and, and with the regulator, I think we all need to be pushing not just for regulatory compliance, which we all will do anyway, mm -hmm. but actually to drive good, you know, social good and real change. I think this, we're uniquely positioned. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry if there were more questions on the floor that I didn't get to. I just want to thank my panel members very much for their active participation. Thank you for your questions and for your attention. And I'll hand back to Gina. Thanks a million. Thanks so much, Mary Elizabeth, and to our panel for such an engaging last session of the day. Um, a couple of things just to mention um, before I invite Jerry to come up to wrap up today's proceedings. So for those of you returning tomorrow, and I know quite a number of you are, um, you can hold on to your delegate badges and bring them with you tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we'll hear from Sean Fleming, Minister of State, and as you will have heard earlier, from EU Commissioner Mairead McGuinness, um, who will take part in a fireside chat with the Deputy Governors Sharon Donnery and Derval Rowland. Um, we also have two very interesting panel discussions lined up for tomorrow on innovation and climate change topics, which have come up quite a bit today and, and even in our most recent panel. So registration opens at 8.15 in the morning and we're really looking forward to seeing you all then. For my final job of the day then, I'd like to invite Jerry Cross, uh, Central Bank, Bank Director of Regulation, Policy and Risk to the podium. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. And uh, late in the day, uh, good good day to, to you all. Um, I'll be short. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure uh, to bring the con proceedings of the day uh, to a c close. Um, it has been a rich and insightful day, I think, um, but also a long one. So, so I won't I won't uh, keep you uh, very much longer. Um, I hope you all enjoyed and profited from this first day of the conference, first day of our first conference, uh, as much as I did. And, and, and really many thanks uh, to all of the speakers, to all of the panelists, and, and to you for your participation, your active participation, uh, and, and the questions and engagement. 
Uh, a central motivation and central theme uh, of this conference so far has been the importance of engagement, connection and collaboration. And I think between the formal addresses, the panel discussions, uh, the audience engagement uh, and the networking, uh, the lots of networking outside the room, uh, I think this first day of the conference has been uh, made a really valuable contribution uh, in this regard. The conversation, I think, has been rich and heterogeneous. Um, as Governor McClough mentioned at the beginning, we wanted to bring a wide range of stakeholders together uh, to get not only different perspectives and different viewpoints, but also to get challenge uh, and to, to challenge our own thinking and to challenge each other's thinking uh, so as to, to, to take the conversation and the discussion forward. And I think we've had that in spades, so thank you for that. Um, it's been great to see the broader engagement through the hybrid approach, the, the, the virtual and the, the, the in-person. I think one of the good things, one of the few, maybe the only good things to come out of COVID uh, has been our, our ability to, to harness technology to that effect. Uh, we've had a high level of, of online participation, which has remained uh, strong and steady uh, through the day. So thanks uh, for that to all of you who participated online. Now amongst, uh, again, I'm not going to reprise uh, very much at all, but just, just to say a few things to bring the, the day to, to, to conclusion. Amongst the key topics that I noted uh, during the course of the day, first of all, the question of, of regulatory philosophy, where, where, where we started this morning. Um, we talked about uh, key issues around predictability, proportionality, understanding the benefits and the costs, agility, etc. And it's really important for us as regulators and for the regulator community and the user of financial services um, to be clear about a regulatory philosophy if we are all to do our job well in, in the current context and the ongoing context of rapid change and continually, continuing external challenges. So I thought that was a very rich discussion and one that will obviously go forward uh, over the months and years ahead. Uh, we talked about the challenges of crises and the need to enhance regulation in the non-bank space in light of some of the episodes of, of volatility and challenge that we've seen over, over the recent period. I thought it was really helpful to hear Martin Maloney's triangulation uh, of self-insurance, uh, central bank intervention or laissez-faire. And my sort of sense was as it was about a lot of the things we discussed today, a lot of it's about finding the equilibrium. So if those are the three points in the, in, in, in the triangle, where's the equilibrium which gives you the best uh, overall outcomes? We talked a lot about customer protection, consumer protection, um, something that, uh, as, as, as the Governor and many others mentioned during the course of today, Derville spoke to this at, uh, in her presentation, um, the importance of uh, that balance of customers' interests as well as the ability of firms to be sustainably profitable uh, in, in a competitive environment. So our discussion paper, which was discussed, uh, seeks to foment a discussion uh, about just this issue, about choice and availability and balancing customer and shareholder interests and a lot more to come in that space. Um, some really interesting discussion around financial literacy. Um, again, a lot of uh, agreement around the importance of that as we look forward. I noticed Neve Maloney talking about it being a 100-year project. Um, that maybe seems a very long time, uh, but nonetheless a multi-year multi, multi project. Um, but also particularly interesting views around, for example, the role that innovation can play in the choice architecture um, and how innovation uh, can play a a larger role in supporting consumer and customer decision making. Some very interesting thoughts, of course, about the nature of the relationship between regulator and regulated and financial services users. Um, clearly, an evolving relationship was, was mentioned by, by a number of, of, of participants. Um, and again, where, where engagement and enhanced connection can, can, pay, can pay dividends. It was good to hear the perspective uh, of the SME sector coming through consistently uh, throughout the day. SMEs being the lifeblood of any economy, uh, they fall within both imperatives uh, that are in the title of today's and the theme of today's conference, supporting the economy uh, and delivering for the consumer. Uh, I noted the role of diversity and inclusion in delivering high quality and effective culture and that this was noted as, as being a really significant part. And arising out of that, and then that, that, that theme was picked up in, in, in the most recent discussion, the importance of ensuring that the regulatory enhancements that we are making and continue to make do not, accru do not cut across either, for example, uh, the D&I uh, agenda, which is so important to, to ongoing uh, enhancement, or indeed other unintended uh, consequences. I noted what, uh, what Patricia said uh, in, in that regard in terms of making sure that we get the balance right uh, when we do a new, re new regulation and are very aware of potential unintended consequences as we try, try to be. Um, we heard very much about the importance of regulation being balanced uh, with the need to nurture innovation 
uh, something that is very much uh, uh, to the heart of, of our own thinking at the moment and something which we'll hear a lot more about um, tomorrow. And then finally, from the, 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 the last panel, uh, that, that, that final thought which, which, which I was left with, which was, let's focus on what really matters. There is so much uh, on all of our agendas. There's so much uh, to do. Let's try and find the, the, the way of focusing on those things that really matter the most and where we get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, final key message, as, as Gina was saying, a lot more to come tomorrow. We've got, we've got uh, really, really good sessions. Of course, we have Commissioner McGuinness, uh, who will give, both give an address and have a fireside chat with uh, Deputy Governors uh, Sharon Donnery and Derva Rowland. Uh, we have Sean, Minister of State Sean Fleming, and we have uh, panels on innovation and panels on climate. Uh, so the doors are open from 8.15, with short, a sharp start at 9 o'clock. Uh, I'm asked to say, please, could you bring your badges? Environmentally, we're reusing the same badges as today, um, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you for, for your participation today. Thank you.